Good morning, Oasis. Glad everybody is here this morning. Levitt, good to see you. Michael, way to make it out. Good job. Well, uh, did anybody else miss the Olympics this week? I, I missed the Olympics. I know you missed the Olympics. Curly. Um, I, I am not by any means a sports guy. Uh, most of you probably know that. Um, and, and Crystal and I didn't get to watch every single event in the Olympics, but but I really enjoy the Olympics for some reason. And, and this year, I found that I um, enjoyed different events that I did not anticipate enjoying at all, which was really, really interesting. Um, the first one was, uh, was curling. <laughs> curling. Now, now uh, the very first year that curling became an Olympic sport, Crystal and I were actually at the Olympics, and we went to curling, and I still didn't care about curling. Um, because it was just shuffleboard on ice. And I was like, this is dumb. In fact, uh, Ty, where, where'd Ty go? We, we were, um, we were sitting in, at, at Sun River, the, our, our whole family, which was a chaotic circus, was over at Sun River, um, a couple of weekends ago. And Ty and I were sitting, it was like midnight or something. We're watching the gold medal match of curling. And as this thing starts, I, I lean over to Ty and I'm like, dude, you give us three or four weeks. We could be these guys. Like, th- this is the dumbest, easiest sport ever. And he's like, I don't know, man. Have you ever actually, like, watched it? And I'm like, come on, come on. This is what old people do on cruise ships. This is piece of cake. <laughs> I'm like, I-, I-, I dug myself a hole. I did. Um, the- but what happened is, I- we actually, we- I watched it and I paid attention to what was going on. And Ty's like, man, like, there's some serious strategy. I'm like, just knock these rocks. Like, come on, man. But, it was impressive, Randy. It was impressive. I was blown. Oh, I was blown away. Um, in fact, Ty ended up staying up to like two in the morning to finish this thing out. <laughs> I couldn't hack it. But um, the the second event that I found that I actually really enjoyed ice dancing. I, I know. Take a couple man points out of the account. I, I get it. Um, but holy smokes, that was amazing um it, the the canadians that final set i stand I don't know, whatever whatever you call that thing it was incredible it, it was absolutely incredible usually uh, like if i have to watch ice skating which because i'm married i have to watch ice skating um I, I usually just, I'm, I'm waiting for the, the, the jumps, right? All of the, the crazy flying Cirque du Soleil, aerial, spinny do things. Um, and, and everything in between is just filler. Um, and so when Crystal was like, oh yeah, let's watch ice dancing. And I was like, oh, okay. Is that like ice skating? And she's like, yeah, but there's no jumps. I was like, what? Okay. All right. What are the boys doing right now? Um, and and so, you know, I watch it, and you know, some of them were pretty boring. Let, let's let's be honest. But but the Canadians when they got on the ice, there was it. It was phenomenal. You, you had these two people that had trained their entire lives for this, and and a lot of the Olympics. Let's be honest, is the backstory, right? Knowing where these people have come from, the 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 things that they've had to go through, the the trials and the you know the, all the stuff. But but when they took the ice. It was, it was literal perfection. I mean, it was phenomenal. They were perfectly timed. It, it was as if they were absolute mirrors of each other. It forming this perfect team that they each had their own identity, but they were one unit. And, and we're going to talk about some of that this morning. And so if you'll pull your Bibles out, we're going to be in the Gospel of John. We're going to be in chapter 5 and 6 this morning. We've been walking through the Gospel of John as we prepare for Easter, um, with the hope being that we can look through the eyes of the Apostle John and, and begin to see Jesus the way that John saw Jesus. That we could, that we could see through John's eyes and be able to answer this all-important question, who is Jesus? Not, not just what did Jesus do and what did Jesus say, but who is Jesus? And, and as John writes this gospel and as he, as he tries to pin down the essence of the Son of God, our, our goal and, and his goal for us is to be able to answer this question, who is 
Jesus. And so this morning we're going to take a look at, at two more miraculous signs. They're, they're not just miracles. They're not just really impressive things that Jesus does, but they're, they're signs that point towards something that give us a greater understanding of who Jesus is. And so um, the first one that we're going to look at in chapter 5 happens in the city of Jerusalem uh, at, at the pool of Bethesda. And so we're going to read the first few verses um, together. We're going to start with verse 2. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. Now, quick side note. This is total tangent, but I find it fascinating. I think it's one of the things that we need to talk about because we're here. It has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about, but you need to know this, so give me about 45 seconds. How many of you noticed that I skipped over some verses right here? Did anybody notice that? Did you see that in your Bible where you're reading through and, and, and I jumped from the middle of verse 3 to verse 5 and I skipped the end of 3 and all of 4. Why, why is that? Why is that? If you are on your phone uh, and you're reading a modern translation, not the King James Version, if you're reading a modern translation, you might not have noticed that I skipped some. It's just not in there. You'll notice if you go back and look, it goes verse 3, verse 5. And, and here's the deal. Like, what is that? Why did I never notice that? Well, here's what happens. As scripture is written and translated, you, you have moments where we, uh, uh, and when I say we, it's not like me. I don't actually go and look for these things, but, but we have found older copies of scripture. In fact, John is some of the oldest of all scripture that we know of. And as we find older and older and older and older copies, we get closer and closer to the original text. And sometimes the oldest and closest to the text is different than what we found hundreds and sometimes a thousand years later, right? Because as things get copied, things don't always go well. And, and what, what has happened from time to time is scribes will try and help us. They will try and add things to give us context that we wouldn't have. And this is one of those areas where it seems that a scribe at some point added something to give us more information that we wouldn't have. It wasn't in there originally because the original people didn't need to know it. And so the whole thing about the the uh, the angel coming down and stirring the water and people would jump in and whoever was the first would be healed, that wasn't in the original that, that we know of. And so a lot of the modern translations have taken that out or they've put brackets around that and said, hey, just so you know, this might be helpful, but this wasn't in what we now know to be closer to the original text. Does that make sense? So it doesn't change anything theologically. It doesn't change the fact that Jesus died on the cross or he's the son of God or any of that stuff. It's just letting you know, hey, somebody came along and tried to help us. It's helpful, but it wasn't actually in the original. Does that make sense? It's kind of weird that rock anybody. I kind of like what in the world is going on? Um, if you want to know more about this, there's a lot of, uh, of info out there. We can talk about this later if you want. But I, I find it fascinating. And since we're right here and this is a great example of it, I thought I'd just toss it out there for you just as a curveball. So, continuing on. You're welcome. So, Jesus comes to the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. Uh, Bethesda uh, meaning the, the house of mercy, right? And it is overflowing with sick people. With, with the paralyzed, with invalids, with the blind, all of them hoping to receive some of this mercy. Be, because legend and tradition had said that, that at some point, sometimes, and nobody knew when, an angel of God would come and, and, and touch the water or stir the water or disturb the water in, somehow, in some way, and if you jumped in, you had a chance that God would heal you instantly. And so among all of these people in this quite large pool area. It's, like it, it's two pools and there's, you know, all of this stuff. All of these people have been sitting there and, and they're waiting to see the water stir and then they would jump in. And so of all these people, Jesus walks up and he picks one guy. He picks one guy who he knows has been there for 38 years waiting for his chance to be healed, to, to receive some of this mercy. 
And, and Jesus chooses this guy and heals him like that. Go, take up your mat, head on out. You're good to go. And then John tells us that he slips into the crowd and is gone. Fast enough that this guy doesn't even know who Jesus is or his name and he can't identify him and so he's like, but he's just jazzed and so he does what this guy who just healed him tells him to do like I would do and he picks up this mat that he probably had laid on for years and he takes off. The, the problem being that this happens on the Sabbath. It happens on the Jewish Sabbath and so not only he, but also Jesus, are in trouble with the Pharisees for breaking the Sabbath law. Now, now my big question when I, when I read through this every time, is, is Jesus, who we know is full of compassion and full of generosity and grace and love, has an entire plethora of people that he could heal. But he slips in, heals one, and slips out. Why, why doesn't he go on a healing rampage and just boom, you're healed, boom, you're healed, boom, you're healed, done and done. I'm going to stir up the water. Everybody push somebody in. It's going to be great. Why doesn't that happen? The way that John tells this seems to indicate that Jesus is trying to, to form a, he's trying to get into an argument. He's trying to bring about a conversation that he is wanting to have. And, and for some reason, this is the moment when Jesus decides to begin, we'll say, a conversation. It's a little more heated than that. As you know, um, the, the Jews had an incredible system for keeping the day of rest, the, the Sabbath, holy. They, um, they had created all of these laws and all of these guidelines to make sure that um, not only you, the desire was, was pure. God had said, do not break the Sabbath. Don't, I, don't, I don't want you to work on the Sabbath. God had created this day for the people to rest and to worship God as a reminder. And so the Jews had set up all of these things to make sure that they would do that and they wouldn't accidentally slip into breaking the Sabbath. We, we do these kind of things too. But, but they had gone to such a point that you, you couldn't carry heavy things. You, you had to count your steps because you couldn't walk too far. You couldn't light a fire. Um, you couldn't paint or draw or write or sharpen a pencil. You couldn't brush your hair. You couldn't wash your face with, with soap because you could be creating a lather and you weren't allowed to create. And so you couldn't do that. I mean, it was, it was intense. And these people were very, very... Um, devout. And, and they had created this massive system around the Sabbath, trying to protect something that they knew was very important. But in doing so, they had twisted and turned upside down this thing that God had created for them, this, this Sabbath. And so when Jesus comes in and, and he heals this, this man, this invalid, this, this paralyzed man, and he commands him to pick up his mat and walk. He causes him to break these rules, this, this Sabbath. And, and the two of them, in doing that, kind of kick down this fence that had been set up as a perimeter so nobody could get close to even breaking the Sabbath. They kick down this fence and they start ticking people off. And the Pharisees, they find out about this, right? And, and, and I, we don't know exactly if they're there and they witness it or they hear rumor of this, but they find out about this and they go and they talk to this man and they say, hey, what is the deal? Who told you to do this? How did this happen? And he's like, honestly, I don't really know. I don't know the guy. I just know that I'm healed and it's, it's great. And so um, they, they go and they continue on the search and Jesus finds this guy and talks to him and introduces himself and, and then he goes back and reports to the Pharisees and he says, hey, it's Jesus. Jesus is the guy that did this. And so the Pharisees find out and they, they find Jesus and they question him about this. And they, they, they try and pin him down. And, and in doing so, they give Jesus the opportunity that he seems to be looking for. And Jesus throws down the gauntlet. 
He, <laughs> he goes at it. And he, he says something that is so shocking to them. I, I, I can't, as a, as a 21st century American evangelical Christian, there's nothing that I can portray to you that would be as shocking as what Jesus said to these Jews. And this is what he says. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. My father. Th- this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, which was punishable by death, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. These are two huge things. The, the, the first one, the, the smaller one, um, Jesus is challenging the Pharisees for, for taking something that God had given the people and worshiping it, see, seemingly creating it, it, its own thing that they were focusing on, and, and, and really when it comes down to it, worshiping instead of God. The Sabbath was made for people, not the people for Sabbath. And they had, they had flipped this upside down so that, that there were so many things to worry about. There were so many things that you had to do. There were so many ways that you had to prepare for the Sabbath. And when, once the Sabbath was there, like there, it wasn't restful. It, it was not at all what God had intended it to be. And so Jesus is trying to, Jesus is trying to heal this guy and he gets in trouble for showing compassion and love and miraculously healing someone who's been paralyzed for 38 years. And let me just tell you, any time that the letter of the law becomes more important to you than loving someone, you've failed. When the law is so important that you no longer care how it affects people, you're failing. And so Jesus puts the Sabbath in its proper place. My father is working. My father has been working. He works on the Sabbath. God works on the Sabbath. Do you know that? And so does Jesus. Secondly, Jesus commits the most intense, blatant sin of all. Claiming to be on equal footing with God. The, the creator of the universe. This was a big deal. Both of these could get you killed, but it was the second that was the linchpin for them. So Jesus says, <laughs> Jesus says, you know, hey, my, my father is working and so am I. But then he kind of doubles down on this as, as they're freaking out over that. And he says, he says, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. And then Jesus sets up this beautiful um, speech. It, it's, it's theologically complex and it's beautiful and it's a little confusing but he sets up this scenario where, where he, he equates himself much like an ice dancer with a partner, where, where they are so in sync and they have communicated so much and they are so similar and there's so much going on between the two of them that they are almost mere identical yet completely separate identities. And and it's this beautiful mix of God the Father doing and Jesus doing, and uh, it's just, it's it's phenomenal. And he even gets down to this point, further down along in this, and and you need to read this. It's something else. But, but he goes down and he gets to this point where he's talking to the Pharisees who have given their entire lives to the study of scripture, where their entire culture is built around this. And he says to them this, you search the scriptures 
because you think that in them you have eternal life. You think that in the scriptures you will have eternal life. But it is they that bear witness about me. And yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Jesus makes this claim that all of Scripture bears witness to him. That is a bold claim. That is a bold claim to a group of men who ran this country based off of this Scripture. And to say, your entire system not only was created by God the Father and therefore created by me, but it's all pointing to this guy. That is a bold claim. And and it's hard to convey to us how offensive that would be. And so they began plotting his death. And at the end of this, this, this beautiful, complex, theologically rich speech that Jesus gives, at the end of this, John jumps us to Galilee, the Sea of Galilee during during the Passover. Right, um, this celebration where the people of Israel remember what God had done for them in Egypt, where He had come in and and broken the bonds of four hundred years of slavery, and through the shedding of the blood of the Lamb and these plagues and the angel of death coming over and passing over the people, He frees them from Egypt into the desert wandering for 40 years, and then eventually gives them their own home in Israel. And so it's during this Passover feast on the Sea of Galilee that Jesus does this amazing miracle that that all of us have heard about, right? The the feeding of the 5,000. 5,000 men. And some people say, hey, it could be 10 or 15 or 18 or 20,000 people with, with women and children and all that. I mean, just thousands of people fed with five loaves of bread and two fish. And and like the people who were there, oftentimes when we read this, we focus so much on on the miraculous and on how amazing it was that God pulled this off, that Jesus multiplied this tiny, insignificant amount of food and fed thousands and thousands of people to the point where there was so much that they picked up a ton of extra food afterwards. And we love to uh, to, to focus all of our attention on the miracle. But John tells us that, that this is a, it is a sign. That it is not just something amazing that happens, but it's pointing towards something. And ultimately someone. And, and these people are so fascinated and, and fixated on what Jesus can do. Can do for them. That, that they decide that they want to make him king. And Jesus recognizes this. And he slips away again up into the mountains. Before they can grab him and force him to become king. And so the next morning, um, after Jesus walks across the water, which again, you should be reading because it's fantastic, the the people chase him down and and find him the next morning. And they they say, hey, we're we're ready for the next miracle. We're ready for the next. What do you got for us now? Where's the bread? And, And Jesus calls them out. And he says, you guys are just chasing free meals. You're chasing the, the miracle and you're missing the man. You're missing what I'm trying to tell you, what I'm trying to show you. What, what you need is not another meal to fill your bellies for a couple of hours. You need something that will satisfy your deepest hunger. And so Jesus then takes and he, and he pulls together their ancient past and what was going to happen to them in their not-too-distant future. And he uses this f- complex and, and, and honestly quite disturbing word picture of, of eating his flesh and drinking his blood to, d- to describe the way that the Israelites need something so much deeper than just another meal to get by for just another day. That, that survival mode. He, he tells them how, how the bread that they ate in the wilderness, this manna that God was sending 
to sustain them while they waited for the promised land. How that, that wasn't enough. That they needed something more. And just like he had given them bread and fish yesterday, they didn't need that yet again. They needed something that was so far different. Something that was, he, he says, real. And to them, they're like, this doesn't make any sense. What are you talking about? And he tries to, he tries to address this deep spiritual starvation that is going on with these people. He says, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 34, they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Chapter 6, verse 47. Truly, truly I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven. So that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus makes this, this connection for them, trying to help them to, to understand that, that true life, not just life where you, you eat and you go to work and you come home and you sleep and you get up and you eat and you go to work and it's just this constant repetition. But true life, life that is worth living, that not only fills you, but fulfills you, it is only found through knowing and believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he is this living bread that came down for us. And it was on the same day, the Passover, a couple of years later, that Jesus would sit down with his disciples and explain this once again explain to them and create this 2,000-year-old tradition that we're going to partake in once again this morning. For through the sacrifice of Jesus' body and the shedding of his blood, that we are reconciled to God and that the gift of eternal life is given freely to all who would partake. And so this morning, as, as we wrap this this morning up, and, and we come and we partake in these elements that have been done thousands and thousands and thousands of times, over thousands of years. I want us to remember one more time what Jesus said, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. It is the self-sacrificing love of Jesus that he calls us to replicate. So who, who is Jesus? Who, who is this man that John so fell in love with, was fascinated with, 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 that walked with him and talked with him, that was confusing and that was bizarre and was deep? Who, who is this guy who says, I want you to eat my flesh and drink my blood? That is just weird. That is a big ask. And, and when Jesus asks this, it is not, it does not go over well. It goes over about as well as you would think. Scripture says that many left, not surprisingly. How, how does that land with you? Is that just weird? I, I've been reading this over and over and over, and I've been doing this my entire life, and it is still weird to me. Who, who is this Jesus that claims that he is one with God, that they are so tight and so together, that they are so intertwined, that anything that the Father does, the Son does, and anything that the Son does, the Father does, that they are one in the same. Who is this God that is willing to break down every barrier, even the barriers of religion 
of custom, of government, of comfort. This is the bread of life. The bread of life who came to sacrifice himself for me and for you. I want you to remember these words. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Heavenly Father, it is with great gratitude and thankfulness that we partake in these elements that represent the reality of who you are. The God, the creator of the cosmos, who came to dwell among us to show us who you are to reconcile us to you through your death and not ours so that we can be reunited with you in relationship that was not possible were it not for the bread of life. Go with God. Have a great week, Oasis.